Hi folks, uh, this is Jason and I uh, hope everybody's okay today and we're going to be looking at Christianity boring, untrue and irrelevant uh, by my good friend uh, Mark, he's going to give us the study and um, so over to you Mark and I uh, hope everybody enjoys what he has to share. Okay, so we've got a reading from John chapter 14. Set your troubled heart at rest. Trust in God always. Trust also in me. There are many dwelling places in my father's house. If it were not so, I should have told you. For I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I shall come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way I am taking. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus replied, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me just in that verse verse 6 jesus makes a statement and he points to three three directions three truths he says he's the way he is the truth and he is the life and that no one comes to the father except through jesus Many people think Christianity today is irrelevant, untrue, and boring. And uh, that was my problem years ago before I was a Christian. I just thought being a Christian was about watching songs of praise and um, being totally boring. And um, I thought it was about having life sucked out of you and just being being uncool and be not fitting in I, I, have, I have this idea i remember going out on the town and putting the tv on and i remember songs of praise was on and i remember that the, they were singing onward christian soldiers and i remember thinking to myself you know onward christian weirdos I thought, how can you be so boring as to go to church and sing all these old hymns? I mean, what what's it about? And uh, it wasn't until I encountered Jesus myself in 1996 when a man came around my house and he shared the gospel with me. And um, I was lost at the time. My mum and dad had just been divorced. And he just came around and told me that the problem was sin. And sin was anybody whose life was not submitted to the lordship of jesus christ and he told me that christ came to give me life and i used to argue with him. I used to, i used to think the guy was crazy and he used to basically tell me jesus has come that you may have life and life in all its fullness and i used to argue with him i used to say christianity is boring it's untrue and it's irrelevant but at a point of desperation I asked Jesus to come into my life. I says, I'm broken, Lord. I says, I, I can't live life my own way anymore. I need you to sort me out, fix me, fix me up, sort my head out. And um, from that moment, my life it was, it was transformed. And I found out that Christianity wasn't boring or untrue or irrele irrelevant. In fact, it was true. And I realised that Christianity wasn't just about believing a set of doctrines or singing hymns. It was about a person. That the heart of Christianity is a person, and that person was Jesus. And it was about a relationship with God. Lived out in a relationship with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And relationships are exciting. And uh, God is exciting. Christianity is exciting so I, I came to find out personally on a personal level that when jesus says i'm the way i am the truth and i am the life 
I, I don't understand that now in a theoretical way. I've actually experienced that statement as fact on a practical level in my own life. So Jesus, first of all, he, he said, I am the way. You know, many people, they are lost. Just in the, in, in the times of Jesus, people were the, were the same, they were lost. Jesus said that people in his day were like sheep without a shepherd. That's how he described people. And uh, people like that today, people are lost. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for purpose. And they're looking for peace. You know, Freddie Mercury, in that famous song, said, said, does anybody know what we are living for? That famous song from the Highlander movies. And that's a question everyone's asking. Does anybody know what we are living for? And you might be asking tonight, what am I living for? What is the purpose of my life? Is the purpose of my life to come on Skype? Is the purpose of my life to be clever? Is the purpose of my life to um, fulfill my ambitions? Actually, the purpose of your life is for you to be at peace with God. And only when you're at peace with God will you be at peace with yourself and be at peace with others. Freddie Mercury was a multi-millionaire. And just before he died in an interview, he said that he was desperately lonely. Despite all the fame and wealth, he was, he was lonely and he was a, he was a broken man. And Prince Charles said this, he said, for all the advances of science, there remains deep in the soul a persistent and unconscious anxiety that something is missing, some ingredient that makes life worth living. And that ingredient that's missing is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, you know, life is like, to, to, for, for a cake to rise, it needs sugar and flour, it needs the right ingredients. You know, unless it's got the right ingredients, it won't be a cake. And unless you have God in your life, you won't be the person you've, you've um, God created you to me, to be. So men and women create to live in a relationship with God. And without this relationship, this emptiness will never leave. There's big ultimate questions, questions like, what am I doing on earth? What is the point of my life? What is my purpose? Where am I heading? Those, those questions are called the big ultimate questions. And also, we, we have everyday questions, questions that concern practical living day by day. You know, personal ambitions like when when will I find a girlfriend? You know, will I ever find a job that I like doing? You know, will, will I get the money for this Friday night so I can go out? But behind the, those questions is one ultimate question. And the main question is this, where will I find peace and fulfilment? And Jesus said he was the way to peace and fulfilment. He's the one that gives us direction. Jesus didn't say he was our way, but the way. And this offends modern minds in the pluralistic culture. People say, well, you can't say that today. It's, we live in a culture that's diverse. There's lots of religions, there's lots of paths. How, how can you say it? Jesus is the only way? But in the time of Jesus, there was even more gods than he is today. It was a pluralistic culture. It was diverse. But still, Jesus Christ said he was the only way. And Jesus Christ says that today. He is the only way. So Jesus is the way. So Christianity is not boring and irrelevant and untrue because Jesus claims he is uh, the way. Do you add anything to that, Jay? 
Wow, that's just awesome, mate. Uh, I'm just really blessed by what you're saying. It's just blessed, me. I spent the whole day today listening to top academics on epistemology, and what you said has been 100% more a blessing to me. And one of the academics, she said that uh, in the theory of knowledge, it's about not just how, how we know things, but it impacts our life. And mm. what you're doing and what you're showing is that Christianity is relevant to, to, to our life. Um, and that's what it's all about, is that we can have, we, we can be more human as we come to be reconciled with our creator. And, and that's mm. what God wants us to be. He wants us to be the people, his people, and the way he created us to be uh, in a more full human sense. And that can only come by knowing Christ and knowing him. And you've touched on those things. And I think it's just wonderful. Yeah. So the, other, the second thing he said, he, he didn't just say he was the way. He says he was, he was the truth as well, which means that, you know, Jesus brings us reality in a confused world. And, um, you know, people say today, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere you know you hear that don't you it's a popular popular yeah. thing but it's possible to be sincerely wrong it's like the yorkshire ripper he believed he was right you know killing all those people but in fact he was wrong yeah. and all behavior stems from what you believe yeah. what we believe is it is is important everything we do results from what we believe and you know we live in a, a media control world today you know the newspapers they're full of lies you know pe people are not sure what to believe because yeah. you got have that many different stories yeah. and i'm just reminded when we talk about knowing jesus as truth we're not just talking about an intellectual truth we're talking about something that's personal yeah. something that changes you and you can't really know it's like it's like you can't it's hard to explain to people who don't know christ you know it's like it's hard sometimes to to prove something experiential you know it's like burning your hand in a fire you might burn your hand in a fire and someone might say oh well you haven't burned your hand in a fire but you say well i, well, I know i have because you know i can feel the pain and say that with Christianity, you know, you know when you experience Christ. Yeah. You know the objective truth of Scripture. It talks about when you come to Christ, you feel like your sins have been forgiven. Yeah. I know the word of God's truth because I've experienced that. It talks about being filled with joy. Yeah. I know because I've been filled with joy. I've experienced the objective truth of Scripture in a subjective way. Yeah because it's personal so Jesus is the truth it br he brings reality to us in a confused world he also said that he was the life so Jesus is the way Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the life you know in Jesus we find life where before there's fear before christ there's fear there's addiction there's guilt you know jesus um replaces the jesus replaces those strongholds and bondages that are in our lives when we live without god those things that hold us down paul tillich the, the post one theologian he described the human condition as one that always involves three fears. He says the entire human race has three main fears. Mm. He says the, the first fear is the fear about meaningless. Mm. And, um, you know, it's important. I don't know if it, I used to suffer from peer pressure before I was a Christian. I had to fit in I had, to, I had to i had to perform to be accepted mm. because i thought 
you know, my life won't have any meaning if I'm not important with my peers. But actually, when you meet Jesus, you encounter Jesus, that peer pressure is taken away. Mm. It's like a weight took off you. The, you know, you don't have to strive for meaning anymore because your meaning is in Christ. Your meaning is in your relationship with God. Mm. You know, the, the, the second fear is the fear of, about death. You know, atheists talk about, um, they really say, oh, well, I don't believe in God. And, you know, you know, sometimes if people are on an airplane and the airplane goes down, what's the first thing they do? But they cry out to God sometimes. Oh. Fear of death. And the third one is the fear about guilt. You know, we, 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 we're weighed down because we feel guilty because of sins that we've committed. Oh. Our sins follow us around. You know, the um, it's like a... It's like a yapping little dog following you around all over the place and you can't get rid of it. Mm. And sometimes as we get older, we remember sins from our youth and we can't get over them. Mm. But the good news of the gospel is this, is Jesus Christ offers total forgiveness. Total forgiveness. How amazing is that? Mm. Mm. The slate is wiped clean. The slate is wiped clean. It's like when I used to work in uh, in a school, we used to have a whiteboard. It used to be blackboards when I was at school. If you imagine taking a piece of chalk mm. and writing every sin you've ever done on this board, mm. you know, we all have personal sins for, you know, for some it's um, lying, cheating, anger, murder, thieving, whatever it is. You know, out the, out the board of our lives are covered with different sins. Oh. And people feel weighed down and all your sins are written on that board. But when you come to Christ, oh. it's like Jesus getting the board rubber and just wiping the board clean. And it's a clean slate. And you wake up the next day and you start with a clean board. And at the end of the day, you know, you might have sinned. There might be a few more words on that board. But Jesus, again, he takes his board up and he wipes those sins off. And every day we get a clean a clean slate. And coming to Christ is a clean slate. It's having your sins forgiven. So Jesus meets those three fears head on. Isn't that amazing, Jay? Oh. Jay is like a, Jesus is like a truck, you know. He meets things head on. He, he meets the fear of meaningless head on. He meets the fear about death head on. And he meets the fears about guilt head on. Mm. You know, Jesus is not irrelevant. He's, he's the truth. And these three fears that come from our fallen sinful state, you know, we want to, we always want to, before I was a Christian, I always wanted to do good. But I could never seem to do it. Oh. And that's because we're born with a bias to sin. It's like ball, I don't know if you ever know, you know the bowling balls, if you on the green the bowling balls on the green. Oh. If you bowl a if you bowl a bowling ball, it's got a bias to turn a certain direction. Oh. The weight in the ball, and that's what sin is like. The human condition. It goes it goes towards um, corruption or fallenness. Oh. So humans are biased towards sin. You know, I've got two kids. Oh. I don't have to teach my children to be bad. It comes naturally. I've actually got to teach them to be good. Oh. Because even in children, the sinful nature comes out. There's a story about um, a little boy and... Um, he has a pet goldfish, and his pet goldfish dies, and he starts crying, and his dad says to him, son, he says, don't worry, he says, I'll tell you what, to cheer you up, I'll take you to McDonald's, oh. and he says, uh, phone your mates up, and um, tell them that I'm going to take it out, and we'll go to the cinema, and we'll get some ice cream, and we'll have a great time, 
So the little boy phoned his mates up and he says, my goldfish has just died. And But my dad says, he's going to cheer me up. And he's told me to phone my friends and invite us all out. We're going to the cinema and we're going to have ice cream. And we're going to go to McDonald's. And he's getting dead excited. Oh. And all of a sudden, the goldfish comes back to life and starts swimming. And his dad says to him, son, son, look. Your goldfish, it's not dead. It, it's, it's alive. And then the little boy looks at his dad and he looks at the goldfish and then he looks back at his dad. And with a look in the little boy's eyes that his dad's never seen before, the little boy says to his dad, let's kill it. And what that is, it's, a, it's an illustration of what human nature is like. He wasn't really bothered about the goldfish because he, he wanted the ice cream in the McDonald's. Mm. And it's what we're like at the heart, the heart of us. You know, we're, we're, we're selfish. Yeah. And that's, why we, that's why we need forgiveness. There was... Um, the New Testament claims that Christ paid the price for the sins of the world. Yeah. In the 31st of July, 1991, in Auschwitz, uh, Sirens caught a prisoner trying to escape, and um, was it, actually yeah. There's a story about an Auschwitz. Uh, they caught a prisoner trying to escape, and they caught him. And as a punishment, they decided to execute ten other men. Yeah. And so the prisoners were put into a starve starvation bunker, and they would normally stay there two weeks, and then, and then they would die. Yeah. And um, one of the men that picked to die was um, a Roman Catholic priest. And um, he, he was called Father Maxi Mullen. And um, he was on, he was getting ready, he was getting, he was stood there. And um, he was watching these men being executed, these prisoners trying to get away. And one, one, of the, one of the guys broke down before he was getting executed. And he said, oh, I've, got, I've got a wife. And I've got kids, and he, he started weeping. And so the Catholic priest stepped forward and said, I'll take his place. And um, so he stepped forward, and um, he took his place, and he, he, he got injected with a lethal injection. He was 42 years old. And in October 1982, at St. Peter's Square, they had, they had a celebration for this Roman Catholic priest who, who did this did this act and um, and present there was was the prisoner with his wife and, and, and children, his great grandchildren, the man who uh, the Roman Catholic priest took his place. And um, you know that's an amazing story, isn't it? When you think about that, Jay, a Roman yeah. Catholic yeah. priest steps forward and actually lays down his life for this man. But what's most amazing about Jesus is this: is he just didn't lay down his life for one person. Yeah. He laid it down for the entire human race. Yeah. And um, you could have been the only only person on, on the planet and Jesus would have come and died for you personally. Yeah. If you were the only person on planet Earth. And so Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and life, and life in all its fullness. So what we're saying is Christianity is not boring. It's not untrue and it's not irrelevant because Jesus comes and he offers us direction in a lost world, reality in a confused world with truth and life yeah. in, a, in a dark world. So do you want to add anything, Jay? That's just a few thoughts. It's awesome, mate. I just absolutely love that, man. I really did. Um, I liked I, I I thought it was excellent and great and encouraging how you talked about Christ as a person and about mm. how we can know truth not just it's not just ob objective but it's experiential that we experience God and um, I think that um, in how we know what we know um, it's it is about a person and um, you know a lot of these skeptics will say or oh, you've got to have critical thinking and crit uh, critically analyze what what you believe and you shouldn't teach your kids uh about what you believe unless you're certain about it but 
our our belief is in Christ and he's a person and we can know that person uh, in history and in our experience and the more you, you get to know that person the more confidence you have in in that person um, and you know skeptics fail to realize this personal dimension they often attack and critique personal experience but they don't realize that Christianity comes with with uh, a double whammy it comes with objective evidence i.e the life and death and resurrection of christ and it mm. comes with experience and the two are together and the skeptics are always trying to uh divide and rule they're always trying to say there's no evidence for christianity and you shouldn't listen to your experience but they fail to realize that christianity is experience it's also mm. objective facts in in the historical christ but it's also about a person and it's this dynamic of a person and critical thinking i mean you don't you know how many people go around doing uh, logical analysis of the wife or the husband you know <laughs> you, you just yeah. don't, you just don't go around doing critical analysis of your wife or your husband every five minutes yeah. if you did they'd think you're a nutter you know yeah. <laughs> these atheists and critics they walk around saying we've got to be critical thinkers and analyze everything but they don't actually do it in reality in their relationships and christianity what you focused mm. on is about a relationship and that's what it's yeah. all about there's this story i've got a friend here and um he done this mean at spring harvest this is a true story some years back and um he done this little meeting group called just looking and it was basically a, a place where the people at, some people at Spring Harvest didn't want to be there, so they, they were trying for something else. And they, they just basically shared about Jesus. And anyway, there was this one of this one of these men in his group, and he asked all the men there and the women there and introduced themselves. And this one guy, he had something like three PhDs. And he said, uh, "He said I've got a PhD in uh, in physics. I've, I've got this qualification, that qualification." And my mate's just a simple lay preacher. Yeah. And he thought, oh, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> but he was explaining Christianity with him. And this went on for three days. And the first day, he was coming up with them all these intellectual questions. And, you know, and he didn't have, he didn't have answers to a lot of them, you know. Yeah. He was just preaching the gospel. And, but on the, on the third day, um, the man started to uh, open up a bit and he started coming out again with all these objections, intellectual objections. And, you know, my friend looked at him and he said, I just want to tell you this. He said, Jesus didn't come to scratch your intellect. He came to forgive your sins. Oh, okay. He says, do you, do you want to be forgiven? And he says, this man just broke down and wept. This is a true story. And he said, do you know what? He said, I came here this weekend and he said I plan to commit adultery because my, I'm fed up with my wife and I, I just I want to end it all and he says I came in again he says I heard you talking about forgiveness and the cross and um, and Jesus oh. and he says I, I just can't do it he says I want I want to give my life to Jesus and he says I want to I need to tell my wife what I was going to do and he basically got saved and um, and he went back the next year my mate and he was there and he was doing up and down full of the Holy Spirit on fire for Jesus you know and he was saying oh this is what happened last year I've joined a, I've joined the church and I've been given my testimony and all the rest of it but a cut long story short he was this intellectual you know and, and he what it was is it's a lot of it's sin. Yeah. The barrier is sin. Yeah. People, what I found over the years is this: intellectuals. Well, let, let's just say it like this: most objections to Christianity aren't intellectual objections; they are moral ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I found because oh. they know that if the claims of Christ are true, yeah, I totally agree, mate then that means there's certain things in their lives that have to change there are certain sins they're going to have to repent of there's certain values and ideas that are going to have to change very rare i'll tell you this now jay 
from 15 years of evangelism and talking to thousands of people about Jesus, very rarely are the intellectual objections. The intellectual objections are a disguise. Yeah, yeah. Because what people have, they don't really have intellectual objections. They have emotional hurts yeah. wrapped up in intellectual disguise. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's what I found. And this is, I'm talking from experience, like we say. Some of them do. Some of them need some of these barriers, you know, the, 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 the believed wrong things, the being taught wrong things. But giving your life to Christ is, is, is a moral, is a, is a moral commitment. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it's like, um, before I came to Christ, he's an example. Before I came to Christ, um, I was a bit, um, I was a bit of a man's man. You know, I, I like the ladies kind of thing. And when this man came out speaking to me about Jesus, one of the obstacles that stopped me from coming to Christ was the, was the, was the view about sex before marriage. Mm. I couldn't accept that the fact that if I became a Christian, I'd have to wait till I was married before I had sex. Yeah. It just seemed ridiculous to me. I thought, in this day and age, it's absolutely ridiculous, you know. I could accept everything, but that was the one barrier that stopped me. Yeah. You know, and in the end, I, I, I realised, I said to God, I said, you know what? If this is, if Christ is true, and Christianity is true, I'm going to have to accept it all or nothing. Mm. And I said to God, I said, you know, I'm, I don't like this teaching in my own in my own head. It seems ridiculous, but I believe the word of God. Mm. I believe that you said the best way to enjoy sex is in the context of marriage. And so when I met my wife, Claire, we didn't have sex until we were married, mm. which was a miracle for me. Mm. Because life before Christ I had lots, you know, I, I had I had lots of encounters with women. But I wanted to obey God. It was a moral choice. Mm. It was a moral objection that I had coming to Christ, not 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 an intellectual one. Mm. And that's the thing when we live for Christ. It's a different world. People don't have to accept Christianity if they don't want to. Mm. But if they accept Christianity, they've got to accept Christ's way of life, mm. Christ's standards. And I think that's hard for some people, isn't it? Yeah, I think what what's interesting, uh, what what you've said really fascinating because like today I've just spent quite a lot of hours listening to like, <coughs> academic philosophers and uh, physicists, theologians, and all sorts of academics talking about theories of knowledge, and a lot of the skeptics that I've been listening to today, um, it they they present it as if they're being rational but like you said there's this moral dimension and you know that doesn't get a mention and i think it's because they're frightened of the challenges that it, it brings to their life and they feel threatened by it um uh, so i think you're right in what you're saying yeah um but I would say this as well, I would add to this that there might be some people, Jason, that want to make that step of faith. Yeah. And there's there's, there's obviously there's fears that, you know, I, I used to think, what if God ruins my life? You know, yeah. what if I, what if he sends me to Dakis Black, East Africa or something or, yeah. you know, and there's these fears like that. And um, But what you find is when you truly trust in Christ, you know, it's um, God. There's more blessing in following Jesus than yeah. not following Jesus. You know, and yeah, yeah. I would say God's plan's good. Yeah, yeah. And um, God's God's got a good plan. Yeah. God's got an awesome plan, and you know, God God loves God loves you, and. Um, yeah, I understand the fears that people have, but does, does, does Jesus has come to take away fear, that's the point. Mm, mm. 
that's what um, the the number it says in the New Testament that all fears are related to the number one fear, which is the fear of death. Yeah. All fears are really the the fear of death. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but as we say, Christ has destroyed the power of death. Mm. And um, I, I just coming back. I'm just looking at the title, and I'm just going through it in my head, like. Christianity, I mean, we've known each other for quite a while, and in all that time, I'm, I'm, both of us would say that there's no way in a billion years that Christianity is boring, wouldn't you say? <laughs> that it's exciting, isn't it? Even the difficult times, mm. it, it's a, it, it's a, it's never boring, is it, bro? No, it's definitely not, never. It can never be boring. It's it's exciting because you you're getting to know the the creator of the universe and and you're always learning you're always growing you're always exploring because it's a relationship and you know relationships are get deeper and deeper as time goes on. Mm. Uh, this issue about untrue, I mean, um, in all the time I've known you, when when we were at seminary. Um, when we all over the years studying would you say that christianity has has, has taught you to not face ish, intellectual issues to put your head under the sand or has, has christianity taught you to study and think well it's definitely taught me to study and think so you know that, that's my yeah. experience it's never taught me not to think and in terms yeah. of re irrelevant or relevant i mean the big issues in life and the issues of today christ and and the new test and the bible would you say it's relevant or irrelevant i mean what are the big issues today and how does the bible speak to that and you know the big philosophical questions that you approach the bible answers those questions so i would yeah. you know in my own experience i i don't see the bible is irrelevant yeah well i was talking about this a couple of weeks back i mean the, the thing is with christianity is it christianity is supernatural it's a supernatural faith and um, it's a legit yeah yeah and i remember when i first became a christian i'd um i'd got up one morning it was my birthday and there was no birthday cards oh. and i remember feeling like you know really really down and i remember reading the scripture and it talked about when peter and john were brought in to the authorities and told not to preach in the name of jesus oh. and it said that it said that they got flogged and whipped and, and sent out and it said they left the temple rejoicing yeah because they they uh, glorify they glorified god because they were suffering for the gospel and i was really sad but as i meditated on the scripture oh. i got filled with the holy spirit and i got filled with joy yeah yeah and i was walking around the front room and i thought i was thinking i needed a birthday card but what i needed really was comfort from god oh. and it was the scripture coming alive that filled my heart with joy it was supernatural oh. and that's the that's the thing with, with the bible you know the bible is a, a supernatural book oh. christianity is a supernatural faith and um you're never going to get it coming from a rational basis all the time because the rational is natural yeah yeah and faith is is supernatural yeah but it's like it, it's not a leap into the dark as some of the skeptics say yeah it's a, it's a leap into 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 light objective light based in history yeah and experience as well but it is it is supernatural it's a supernatural change So should we should we close in prayer, Jay? Yeah.
Nice. Okay, then. Okay. Lord, I just thank you for this talk, Lord, and I just pray for anybody who hears this talk, Lord. I pray that they would come to know you, Jesus. Come to know you as the way, the truth, and the life, Lord. I pray for each one, whatever issues they're facing in the life, Lord, whatever things that they have in the life, that they would know, Jesus, that you are more than a match for any fear, Lord. Yeah. More than a match, Lord. Mm. And Lord, all fears crumble before you, Jesus, before your majesty. Mm. All fears and all, all, all things crumble at your authority, Jesus. And I just pray that you blow the wind of your Holy Spirit over those problems, Lord. Over those issues that people are facing, God. I pray that Jesus, you would come into their lives in a supernatural and real way, God. Mm. I pray for blindness to fall off, off people's minds, Lord, right now. Mm. I pray, Father, that people will be struck to the heart, Lord, by your Holy Spirit now. Mm. That hearts will be changing. I, I pray for people who have encounter with Jesus now, Lord. Mm. An encounter wherever they are. They'll hear the voice of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that they'll come to know your life. I pray for people who are lonely, God, who feel unloved, feel worthless, that would, they would know that, Lord, they're not an accident, Father, but they were, they were created and had a purpose before the beginning of time, Lord, that they would find that purpose in you, Jesus. I pray for people who have troubled marriages. I pray, Lord, that you would come and fix that marriage, Lord. Mm. Bring forgiveness and healing to that marriage, Lord. I pray for people who are bound up with all kinds of sins and shame, Lord. Mm. Lord, there's people out there who are ashamed and living in sin, and there's a fear that people are going to find out mm. what they're really doing. The shame, oh, what, what will they do if people find out? Mm. It doesn't matter, Lord. What matters is what you know, God. God, your word says that. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. And I pray, God, that you'll take out the fear of man, that snare from people's lives, Lord. Mm. Lord, I pray for people in debt. Balls in debt, God. Maybe it's the fight about losing the house. I pray, God, that you will supernaturally intervene mm. and sort those debt problems out, God. Lord, you just took a small loaf and a couple of fishes and multiplied it, Lord. Mm. Nothing is too hard for you, God. And I pray that to people, Lord. Mm. Thank you that we can be free from all sin, Lord. It says all sin, mm. not just some, all. You've conquered the power of death, Lord. And you reign within us. I pray for people who are sick, God, that you will heal them, Father. Heal them completely from head to toe, Lord. Lord, there's people out there with sinuses. I pray you would heal them sinuses, Lord. There's people out there who've got a bad back. Mm. I pray, God, you would come and heal that back now. Speak to that back, Jesus. Lord, there's people who are having problems with their eyes. So eyes, Lord. I pray now that they would heal. Those eyes would heal. In Jesus' name I pray, God. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this day. Um, Lord, I thank you uh, for what Mark has shared. I thank you that we're brought back to you again. Um, we just give you the prayers and the glory today. Um, Father, I just pray what's shared would be a blessing to all of us and that we would be drawn to you. And those who do not know you would find you, Lord, and find you as their lord and savior and so lord we praise you we give you the glory we pray for family and friends that you'd be with each one we pray for those who are suffering in foreign lands we pray that you'd be with them who have been martyred we pray for their families and lord we pray for your church worldwide and we pray lord that you be with us all now in jesus name amen amen 
Amen. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming to hear uh, Mark share this uh, message. And thank you for Mark uh, for what he shared. Uh, I can we'll do some more, Jason. I'm going to do fifth, the whole the whole talks the next couple of few weeks. Okay. Well, that's going to be awesome. And I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I have really enjoyed it. I spent the whole day studying epistemology today, and I have to say that out of all that study. The favourite bit of the day has been listening to my brother Mark uh, share the word and, and give me something which is much more relevant than listening to a bunch of philosophers. Uh, so thanks, Mark, and uh, God bless to everybody. Hope that you uh, find this uh, message and discussion a blessing. And God bless you all. Thank you for coming. I'll see you soon.